Greetings nerds, let's talk about world building. There is a massive tech jump between Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra, going from horse-drawn carts to cars, from feudal villages to metropolitan centres of, well, it's New York, and from messenger hockey to telegraphs and radios, though I feel like that last one was a step back. Let's discuss this from a world building perspective and really dig into how this came about in the lore and whether or not this is believable and realistic. But before we get into it, I want to say again a massive thank you to the dozens, now over a hundred people who have signed up to Patreon to support me in the wake of this whole Sony thing. If you didn't know, virtually every Avatar video I have ever made has just been claimed by them. I'm going through the legal stuff, but it's all still very up in the air and I don't know where I'm going to end up. Uh, your support on there means the world because it makes this volatile part of my job so much more dependable. Uh, and as a bonus, uh, one person who signs up to Patreon this month will uh, win a signed copy of On Writing and World Building, which contains all of my content on that side. So thank you if you do. Um, it's It really does mean the world. Anyways. The first big thing to discuss is the proliferation of Fire Nation technology following the end of the Hundred Year War. Despite its size and population compared to other nations, the Fire Nation had a distinct technological advantage from the beginning of the war, notably steam power and coal, which they used to power their massive navy which was their primary method of exerting force around the world. And by the time of Phylord Sozin, sometime around the year 12 BG, they had an advanced metallurgy industry and a huge industrial sector, enough for them to build huge steam-powered warships. And pointing to this, there is an interesting moment in the Avatar and the Fire Lord, where Fire Lord Sozin says, Our nation is enjoying an unprecedented time of peace and wealth. Our people are happy. And we're fortunate in so many ways. And he then goes on to say that this is the prosperity that the rest of the world doesn't have, and that they should share it with them. <laughs> all of this together indicates that the Fire Nation was on the cusp of industrial revolution, all the way back around 75 BG, 250 years or so before Korra was born, and we saw this, Republic City at its height. And the prosperity that Sozin was speaking to was likely the economic advancements and the quality of life increases brought on by steam power, applied not only militarily, but to the textiles industry, faster transportation, creating more connected societies, agriculture, and the industrial sector, making once very expensive everyday things available to the average person, an advantage that no other society really had. And by the end of the war, sometime around the year 88 AG, the Fire Nation have figured out how to develop small mechanized individual units with steam engines. Things like tundra tanks and caterpillar trucks, as well as things like bombs and complex gondola systems. And by the year 100 AG, they had developed an air force with airships. We don't quite know when they developed steam trains, but steam trains and steam powered warships came about within one year of one another in our world, around 1815. And faster transportation on that scale is really important to an industrialized economy. So it's likely that it's pretty old tech, putting it either in the early years of the war or even before then. And it's also totally understandable that these technological advancements didn't spread to the rest of the world because the Fire Nation wasn't exactly inclined to share its trade secrets with the peasants that it was trying to conquer. But after the war, Zuko made an active effort to better the nations around him, sharing the Fire Nation's technologies that allowed for faster and more efficient transportation of people and resources, the energy sources they developed, and agriculture technology would certainly be a part of that. So uh, here you go, here are the designs for the steam engine makes transporting people way quicker, trust me. Yeah, I, I know from all the people you took to prison camps. We also don't quite know how far other sectors of the Fire Nation economy developed in that 150 or so years till 100 AG, but we can assume that there was some degree of development. Oftentimes though, in times of war, technological development is aimed at war things. <laughs> and necessarily, something that sort of alters our perspective on the tech level of The Last Airbender is that most of the story is told from the perspective of people who 
don't have this level of technology. The Southern Water Tribe, Ba Sing Se, Random Earth Kingdom Village number 45. These places don't have those technological advantages, so it feels like the tech is jumping from around 1500s feudalism to 1920s capitalism. But the Fire Nation is really more mid-industrial revolution Europe. Those tundra tanks and the caterpillar trucks bear remarkable resemblance to the Russian... Mmm, yeah, I'm not even gonna try and pronounce that, so I'm just gonna say... Uh, vodka and 20th century tank designs. Basically, the rest of the world got to skip those centuries of development and immediately reap the benefits of the Fire Nation's advancement from the year 100 AG forward. And that is the first of three very important reasons to remember, unless I make up more in the course of this video. Secondly, the unusual roots of Republic City. You got to understand that Republic City is a technological, sociological, geopolitical anomaly in the world of Avatar. Republic City was born from a number of ex-Fire Nation colonies in the Northwest Earth Kingdom. The Harmony Restoration Movement in the year 100 AG nearly led to a second war because both the Fire Nation and Earth Kingdom had citizens who had been born, raised, and died there for decades. They both had real stakes in the region. Unable to decide to whom the land belongs, an independent state was created. The geopolitical forces here meant that the colonies not only benefited from Fire Nation technological developments across that period during the Hundred Year War, but they also had earthbending available to them. The promise notes that the oldest of these colonies, Yu Dao, had the best metallurgy industry in the world by 101 AG, something vital for moving into the Steel Age. In Imbalance Part 1, we see that the Earth and Fire Refinery of Cranefish Town has expanded into a hub for industry by 104 AG, with numerous factories only made capable by the union of earthbenders, firebenders, and waterbenders. Republic City's tech level is a mix of its multiculturalism, which other places didn't have, as well as a several decade head start on all of this over the rest of the world. You'll recognize the land in imbalance as very much the skyline of Republic City, by the way. And though not a perfect comparison, its unique positioning can be likened to the economic success of Hong Kong, a leftover British colony with an unusual geopolitical position, a mix of multiple cultures that ended up with a GDP the size of a major nation due to the combination of these two major powers. And importantly, just as we see most of the last Airbender from the perspective of people with low tech, we see most of the story of the Legend of Korra from the perspective of people with high tech. Republic City is an anomaly. Though this region has advanced a lot, much of the rest of the world hasn't. If you look at the various Earth Kingdom villages that we see throughout the series, like in Season 3 and 4, they're still very agricultural. They have thatched roofs, they rely on horse and cart, and cars aren't very common. In fact, they're rare. There's still a strong feudal culture, and though they're clearly more connected than they were historically, Technological proliferation hasn't wholly dragged the entirety of the agricultural Earth Kingdom into the 20th century. Even Ba Sing Se, the world's most populous city, doesn't advance that much from where we saw it in the last airbender. We do see that they've transitioned from earthbender propelled trams between the rings to steam powered or electrical perhaps. And there are airships as grand as those in Republic City, but even in the upper ring, the richest people in all of Ba Sing Se, people don't use cars they still use rickshaws. So they have developed to an extent, but it's not Republic City everywhere. The Water Tribes, for example, do have electricity. We see that during the festival in season two, and the Northern Water Tribe has adapted the Fire Nation steam power to its warships pretty effectively, as well as developing gondolas and mechanized lifts by 121 AG, and by 102 AG, the Southern Water Tribe has already undergone a reconstruction of sorts with new building technologies from the Earth Kingdom, as well as new oil refineries, indicating a level of petrol technology. But technology hasn't dominated the way of life like we see in Republic City. It's an anomaly and a nucleus for that kind of scientific advancement. But not only did Republic City have unusual advantages in becoming the way it is, but it also did not face the same restraints that many other areas of the world did. Republic City is the land of opportunity, the city that never sleeps, the big orange, the city so nice they named it once. 
And in Imbalance Part 1, we see that from as early as 104 AG, it was already run by an independent council of businessmen. Its inhabitants, benders and non-benders alike, were there for work in the expanding factories, and its culture of innovation developed around that. No true force was pushing back against this technological movement with the exception of Aang in the Rift given it was an area once sacred to the Air Nomads, but even he eventually gave in. Let's compare this to the Earth Kingdom, who always had a traditionalist streak in them, somewhat akin to the isolationism of China that held back scientific advancement. And a significant portion of the Water Tribes actively pushed back against this kind of development. That's what all of North and South was about, an attempt and desire to maintain cultural heritage. This was actually what happened to many Asiatic countries, which eventually culminated in Japan becoming the dominant economic power in the region by the 20th century. And the Air Nomads didn't really advance at all in this period, because they were dead. Republic City wasn't just a combination of its unique geopolitical positioning and a technological head start. It didn't face the same restraints and boundaries that other places had to overcome, or are overcoming, allowing it to become this nucleus for the scientific or industrial community, a perfect storm you might say. So let's not overstate the technological development between The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra. It's kind of like taking Hong Kong or New York City and looking at how much they advanced in 70 years from 1850 to 1820 and imagining that the entire world advanced in the same way that they did, when they didn't. And even more so, consider the Meiji Restoration in Japan from 1868 to 1912. A largely agrarian Japan transformed into the economic powerhouse of Asia. They literally abolished the feudal system because an industrial power, America, showed up and was like, Hey Japan, you wanna trade with us? Of course you wanna trade with us. Good for you, good for me. You wanna find out what happens when you don't trade with me? You don't wanna find out what happens when you don't trade with me. Or that's the Sparknotes version. Within that period, they developed railroads, cameras, radios, telegraphs, all of that, and that was in 44 years. Even less time than we're talking about here. And this too was an anomaly, brought about by the proliferation of industrial level technology in an agrarian society. But it's not bad world building, <laughs> it's history. <laughs> Reminds me of those reddits where like they show upside down versions of Scandinavia and they go, what's wrong with my world building? And people critique the map of Finland. <laughs> And lastly, I want to talk about perspective, because the tech jump may not be as big as you actually think, especially when you account for accelerating factors, with the biggest factor here being energy. So our ages toiling under the sun have really been a long and arduous struggle to reduce our energy input and increase our material output. During the Industrial Revolution, we began using coal instead of wood which was technically more efficient, not in terms of the environment, <laughs> producing high levels of heat and being longer lasting. And eventually, we made the steam engine. This meant that food and material production no longer needed to rely on water sources to power machinery and it became a lot less intensive with not everything needing to be done by hand. This meant that people transitioned away from rural areas to urban areas where they could specialize and scientific development rapidly increased. The point that we're getting to here is that scientific development increased when we found energy sources that were in high supply, efficient and portable. And hey, guess what? You know, the Fire Nation just happens to have just the thing, fire. And in particular, lightning bending. The proliferation of that technique led to Marco being employed in Republic City to generate power, making energy requirements basically a thing of the past. Bending meant that Republic City could skip those barriers to developing high supply, efficient, portable energy. And it meant that it became a hub for industry and technological advancement. Faster than the rest of the world. But if only there was a, a timeline that allowed us to track when all of these technologies came about in the Avatar world, and then to compare it to our world. Hmm. Oh wait, there it is, because I spent ages developing one. <laughs> Let's go through it, compare our two timelines and see what this means. By 74 BG, the Fire Nation had already likely invented the steam engine and begun its industrial revolution, going on to colonize the Earth Kingdom and found Yu Dao by 35 BG and adapt this newfound power to warships and trains by no later than 30 BG. Zero AG, Fire Lord Sozin orders the Air Nomad genocide. And then there's actually a huge technological gap. We don't know what they invented and when in this period. It's also a bit misleading to say that because it's mostly war innovation, not necessarily the rest of the economy. So that's the sort of advancement we would see. 
By around 88 AG, they had designed Tundra tanks, jet skis, and other mechanized units with the help of the Mechanist, later developing huge steam-powered gondola units. And it's also likely that they had developed some form of rudimentary diesel or petrol engine, but hadn't adapted it to any major technology yet. It probably just wasn't efficient enough. It took us a long time to do the same. During the year 100 AG, they developed airships, cannons, and the drill, while Sokka actually developed, with the help of the Mechanist, a single-man caterpillar supply truck, and Toph discovered metal bending, not a technology, but still hugely important to the advancement in the future. By around 101 AG though, or even before then, the Fire Nation colonies, especially Yudao, had developed the greatest industrial sector in the world, with unusually good metallurgy, even probably surpassing our own. It's important to understand just how influential the ability to finely tune heat and metal is in our construction, and the union of these two abilities during and after the war made the industry incredibly efficient, even more so than the industrial era in our world was. By late 101 AG though, Satoru had adapted the gasoline engine into a forklift for his factory. The Southern Water Tribe had begun modernizing by 102 with oil refineries, and by the point of 104 AG, Cranefish Town was actually a small city, diversifying and expanding its industrial sector and modernizing its government with a representative council. And it's at this point that a number of very important bending things happen. By circa 15 AG, lightning bending and metal bending are no longer skills limited to the upper classes and melon lord. These skills are proliferated with a majority of metal benders brought to Republic City by Toph. She trained them in her academy. The camera is also invented sometime around here, judging by this photo of Aang and his family. Five years later, by 120 AG, airships are also commercial. About 135, the radio and telephone develop, and 138, the first commercial petrol car is produced by Future Industries in Republic City. But this technology only just begins to spread. Not everyone has a car, and this is followed by the invention of the phonograph and the power grid, likely with the proliferation of lightning bending, and then there's a period of gradual development, refining and making these technologies more efficient and more affordable over nearly 30 years through Decora arriving in Republic City by 170 AG. So, how does this technological timeline measure up against our own and realistic world building? Basically, over a 200 year period from around 30 BG to 170 AG, the Fire Nation had developed machinery steam power, mobile steam power, trains, tanks, jet skis, petrol and diesel engines, airships, one-man trucks, submarines, cameras, the commercial car, commercial radios, commercial telephones, telegraphs, phonographs, a citywide power grid, mechs, and biplanes. These things were in the 130 year period before the end of the war, and these things were in the 70 year period after the war. Let's compare this to the 210 year period from around 1712 to 1922. We developed machinery steam power, mobile steam power, trains, tanks, petrol and diesel engines, airships, one man trucks, submarines, commercial cameras, the commercial car, radios, telephones, telegraphs, phonographs, a citywide power grid, and aeroplanes. These things were in the 140 year period from 1712 to 1852, while these things were in the 70 year period from 1852 to 1922. And honestly, it matches up pretty well, even if the order is a little bit different. And remember, it's that 70 year period in both of these timelines that really makes up the difference between Avatar The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra. We're only missing jet skis, which came in the 70s, and mechs. Kinda jealous of that one, I'd, I'd love a mech. It's easy to imagine the tech jump between the two shows as going from 1500s feudalism to the 1920s, but it's really more akin to going from 1850 to 1920. We went from horse and cart to cars, from message by hand to telephone. And even then, yeah, it does stretch the timeline a little bit. Things may have been developed a little bit more quickly and become more widespread quicker than they were in our world. But that's not necessarily a criticism of its world building. There's this odd assumption that I see in some world building analyses, that if the development timeline doesn't match up with Earth's development timeline, if uh, it's quicker or more efficient or things happen out of order, then it's somehow unrealistic or bad world building. This is all built on the idea that like our world, our timeline, 
is the best that there can be of humanity and of Earth. When that's just not true, there has to be a parallel world out there where people have like icing dispensers in their home or the office didn't end. But that's not this timeline. Point being, things could have developed quicker in a different order or more efficiently because of the right people in the right places at the right time. If we are to say that there are lots of other worlds out there, we also probably developed unrealistically by another world standard. Who's to say that Nikola Tesla had to be born when he was? But that's pretty much just my thoughts. Let me know yours down below. Also, come join the Discord, the Patreon, get my book. Thank you to the 8,000 of you or something who have already bought it. Seriously, means the world. It's absolutely incredible, the response that I've had to that. Volume 2 is definitely going to be happening one day. For the moment, though, working on my fiction book. Anyways, stay nerdy, and I'll see you in the future.